Today on Keeping It Real, we're talking to Christopher Jarry, military history author and volunteer at The Keep. I'm Christopher, um, and I'm an imposter, because although I have written a number of military histories, I am not a historian. I'm really not. I, have, I know a fair amount about history, but I didn't train as a historian, and my real interest is in writing. It just happens that I write about military history, or have done quite a lot, but not exclusively. So I'll tell you a little bit about how I got into it. And it began with this one, which I wrote when I was in my early 30s. And uh, what happened was this. My mother was uh, married to an RAF pilot who was killed in the Second World War. This chap with the map here, the little one. And. Um, uh, my father was actually a soldier and uh, this chap was killed and my mother remarried after the war and then I was born in 1956 which makes me an old git, 66. And I grew up in a house where this chap was remembered and in the 1980s my father who had been a soldier suddenly found he was a, a, um, uh, approached by a filmmaker who was making a film about the battles as they went into Germany in 1945, so across the Rhine. And as a result of that, my father found, who he hadn't met for years, his old platoon sergeant, two of his corporals, and several of his soldiers, including his runner, who wouldn't be much of a runner now because he was getting on a bit by this time, but uh, he was only 19 at the, in 1945. And it prompted my father to write a book called 18 Platoon, which was about the platoon that he commanded when he was 20 years old and about all these wonderful men who I knew now. And he dedicated the book to this chap, his wife's first husband, who if he hadn't been killed, he wouldn't have married my mother and I wouldn't be here. And one day in the late 1980s, I was sitting thinking about 18 platoon and how nice it was that my father had dedicated it to Jack and it struck me how sad it was that Jack wasn't around to write his own story and that very day my mother phoned me up and said I've been thinking and I'd like you to have Jack's logbook which she'd kept as his pilot's logbook so telling me all about what he'd done and I thought this is a sign so I got in touch with a lot of people who had served in the Royal Air Force with Jack and I produced this book. I doubled my Christmas card list. I had so many friends who were in Bomber Command, all who died now, I'm afraid they died. Um, the last widow died about 10 years ago. Um, but they became a really important part of my life and I learned an immense amount. Now, do any of you know about the Cheshire Homes? No? It's a one, it was a wonderful invention by a chap called Leonard Cheshire who was a bomber pilot, and when he came back from the war, he set up a series of homes um, in this country and right across the world, 150 of them. And he became very famous indeed. And he was this Jack's squadron commander, and he wrote the foreword for this, so I'm very proud of that. But if you go down one of the arcades in uh, Dorchester, you'll find the Cheshire Homes shop. That's it. So that's how I began writing books. And then I spent a long time um, teaching people about how British government works. So I wrote three books about that. And then I came here and they said, we hear you write books, will you write our regimental history? So I said, okay, and it took me two years and that was that one. So that was the first book I wrote for this place. Then I wrote a trilogy, which is those three, about a brigade involving the Dorsets and Devons and Hampshires. And I wrote a couple of others, and I edited two more, and there we are. So that's, 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 that's how it's happened. That's why I wanted to collect some props, um, so you could see. I had no plan to do any of this. It just came my way, and I've thoroughly enjoyed doing it. Now, I'm very happy to answer any questions that you'd like to know, because I've, I've actually learned how to write books. I've taught myself how to do it, and it seems to work for me. Um, and maybe if you want to write books, I can help you, save you some pain. <laughs> uh, so while you're researching these books, what's the most emotional story you've come across? 
that actually is a really difficult one because it is deeply emotional. Because my interest in all of this is the people. I'm not interested in guns. I'm not interested in strategy. I'm not interested in uniforms. I, um, uh, my interest is the people. So I got to, and in writing, I mean, for example, of course, in writing this one, that was really close. Because, I mean, if this chap hadn't died, I wouldn't be here. Um, so it's a very odd relationship, my one with Jack, because he was married to my mother. Um, so writing that, I can remember writing bits of it with tears running down my cheeks. Because you realised, I mean, I was 30 when I wrote this, he was 28 when he was killed. He lost, he had a young daughter. At that stage, I had two daughters. That sort of thing hits home. But writing these three, this is about three battalions of infantry. The first Hampshire's, the first Dorset's, and the second Devon's. And they started off in Malta. Yep, yellow Maltese rock. They then went to Sicily and Italy and landed there and fought there. And they finally landed on D-Day. They were the first troops ashore on D-Day. Now, of course, when you're writing three books like this, you get to know them. You really do get to know them. And very few of them died on Malta. It was a horrible time, but actually only 30 of them were killed on Malta. A fair number were killed on Sicily and Italy. But D-Day and Normandy, the whole campaign in Normandy, was such a crushingly expensive campaign in life. So many young men. When my father got out there, he was told, your life expectancy is three weeks. Well, he actually survived 10 months. So, and survived the whole thing. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Um, uh, but that was, that was what you were dealing with. And of course, finding out about these people and you hear about what they were doing at home in England before they went to D-Day. Um, uh, and then you hear how they died. It's heartbreaking. So you're absolutely right. It's, and we should never, ever lose that because the whole purpose of this place and the whole purpose of these books is, for God's sake, don't get involved in wars if you can avoid it. Because ordinary people like you want to leave, leave there. You know, you want to die in your bed aged about 104, don't you? <laughs> yeah, having enjoyed your family on the way. Yeah, well, this lot didn't get that chance. And that's what's tragic. Did you have a question? Um, yeah. When you write your books, what's your research method like? Um, well, now I cheat. Uh, this one, this one was very, very hard work because it's, uh, what, 30, 32 years ago now, uh, 33 years ago that I was writing it. And I was living up north and all the information was at the National Archives. And you know where they are at Kew? Yep. Um, so I used to have to go there. Um, which was a real pain and you sat there and you wrote it all out in pencil and then you took it home and you typed it up and computers were just beginning to come in then so some of it was typed on an old typewriter some of it was handwritten some of it I did on a very old-fashioned word processor and it was a very very um, uh, cumbersome way of doing it now of course if I wanted to do that I'd get onto the web the very records that I was using, the operational record books for the squadrons that he flew with, where every debriefing after every raid from every bomber crew is recorded. Everything there, the time they took off, what aircraft they were flying, what they saw when they, when they reported back, all of that's there. That now is available on the web, and for three quid I can have a whole month's operational records. Um, Save me getting, I don't even have to leave my study at home. It's there, uh, which is, is fantastic. Nowadays, of course, I can do all that, and I've got Ancestry, so if there's somebody in here and I think, well, how old is this chap? Where's he from? I can look him up on Ancestry and find out where he's from and what he did and what he was doing in 1939. Cause, do, you, do you use Ancestry, any of you? Yeah. There's a, you know, the 1939 sort of census. It's not quite as, it was an employment census, but it shows everybody who was doing a job at that time. So it tells you their age and where they were living and who they were living with and uh, what they were doing. So all of that sort of stuff's available. It helps bring these people to life. But the, the real key is to get other people who are very interested in it to do some of your research for you. So you'll notice that on these later books, 
down here you've got me and then you've got with various other people and those widths are people who do various aspects of the research with me right so um, get somebody else to research what you can't do is delegate the writing I can't anyway I, I, I do the writing uh, and every word in all of these I wrote uh, because I think that's the bit that I can contribute best to. Whereas where the research comes from doesn't matter so much. And I can always, I, I involve in research as well, obviously. Um, so that's how I do it now. And it works, works a trick. And they're a lovely team. They really are. We, every, every time we produce a book, we go and have lunch at Yacht, Pool Yacht Club to celebrate. What was the first book you wrote using internet, Christopher? Using? The internet. It would have been one that's not on this table, actually, which is... It, uh, I wrote for my 50th birthday, which was a series of letters to my great-grandchildren um, about what I knew about the family. Because it struck me that if, you know, I, I can see what I can see, I can see half of what my parents could see, I can see about a quarter of what my great-grandparents could see. After that, it starts to get very vague. And I thought, actually, it'd be rather nice, wouldn't it, to write a, write a book of what I know so that they can see what I can see. So that's what I did for my, instead of having a party or a big holiday or something for my 50th birthday, I wrote a book called The Chance That Made Me, um, uh, which is a series of 40 letters doing just that. Um, and actually, that's the book that I'm, I enjoyed writing most. It was fun. Because you could put in what you liked. Whereas I were rather constrained by that. When we introduced ourselves, you asked us what area of history we enjoyed. And you said Midway. <laughs> Men, no, you said Midway. Um, you said the American War of Independence. Yes, but I was wondering, what's your favourite era to research? Uh, what's your favourite era about history that isn't something you've written a book about? I have never written a book about the Desert War. Um, uh, so um, that would be from 1940 to 1942. But it's still Second World War, that, isn't it? And you're really up here. Is that, <laughs> I think that can, can you live with that? The question specified that you haven't written a book about that. I haven't written a book about that. So I think that um, Yeah. I'm, I, I'll tell you what I really want to do. I want to write a novel about Bomber Command. Because I, nobody has written a really good novel about Bomber Command. And I think it is a fascinating... It's like the, the trenches of the First World War. It, it is unique to those, the experience of those people. It will never be repeated. It never happened before. And it created its, in, its own entire culture, the way people talked to each other, their values, um, quite, quite different. And I learned all about it doing this. I just like to write it in a way that's not constrained by what happened to one person. But it, I, I hope we'll show what it's re really like. So that's the next project. I'm not going to write another one of these for a bit, and I'm going to have a go at that. Do you think it'd be hard to go from factual to? It may well be nigh on impossible. <laughs> I don't know. I, I may not have it in me. I don't know. I've never tried, but I'd like to give it a whirl. Do you ever get bored writing books? <laughs> no, but I'll tell you what happened with this one, and this this I hope will be useful actually because I learned when I wrote this. When you're writing something, you assume you start at the beginning and you move on through the various bits and inexorably you reach the end. And I did start at the beginning and the beginning actually is quite emotional because it, I start, the beginning starts with the end, it starts with Jack being killed and then you go back into the story. And I found actually when I tried to go back into the story, I was getting bored writing it. And that's dreadful because if you're bored writing it, nobody's going to read it, are they? And I thought this is, and I, I, for, I remember for about a month or two, I was thinking, come on, you really must get going. And then I thought, no, you find the next bit that you think is going to interest you and you write that. And so I did. And that was the end bit. So I wrote, I'd written the beginning and the end. And then there was another bit in the middle that interested me, so I went back and wrote that. And then, only then, did I go back and write the bit that I'd had trouble with. And I have done that with every blooming book since then. What you do, you write the bit that you want to write, that 
if you've got it in your head, you've got the mood of it, you've got the language for it, you know how it's going to be, you can feel it, and then you do the, the, the other bits later. And subsequently I discovered, um, you all know the composer Elgar, yep, who's a deeply emotional man. I know he looked like a major general, but he was a deeply emotional man. And he used to write, he, he used to get a, a violinist called Billy Reed to come down and see him at his cottage. And he'd have been writing the vi vi a violin concerto. And when Billy Reed got down there, he'd find a bit of violin concerto pinned to this wall and a bit more around here and another bit over there, all around the walls. And his job was to go around with his violin playing these bits. And then Elgar would move that bit up here and then he'd play it in a different order. And what was happening was a sort of jigsaw, musical jigsaw puzzle. And it's actually, I think, how the creative process works. Now, I'm not saying that anything that I've written is in the same league as Elgar. All I'm saying is I think that is how creativity works. It doesn't work consecutively or in an orderly way. It comes in start, fits and starts. And then there's a next process which is knocking it into shape. This book took immense trouble because all of this is one day. This is D-Day Spearhead Brigade, so it's all about the 6th of June 1944, one particular bit of beach, and 2,000 men who landed on it. So you're getting lots of different views of the same thing from different places, different people, and how do you tell that story? Do you tell it consecutively? Do you go back? Do you do it in bits, these people here? Then you do these people here? There isn't a straight answer. You've got to find the best structure that will work. And it took me ages to sort it out. Uh, but I'm quite proud of it, because at the end of it, I think it works. But it's, 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 that, it's that thinking your way through and deciding what's important, what, how are you trying to put, what sort of tone are you trying to put across, and just letting the creative juices flow a bit. And they will. Is there any bit of uh, writing book that you don't want to do? indexing <laughs> although that's loads easier than it used to be um, because you've got um, once you've got it on the word processor you just press A to Z and it sorts it out as long as you've set it up properly it's 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 bitty but I mean the first first book I indexed years and years ago um, uh, I had to have 26 different sheets of paper for each letter of the alphabet and then you write all the A's in and then you have to put all the A's in the right order, and then you do all the B, and so on. And awful job. What with these uh, being people's stories, and obviously being quite the being these stories being important to people, um, when do you sort of choose that you're going to leave a bit out? So if there's a bit of story, what what would drive you to leave that out? Is it ever in time for that? I've developed a sort of Geneva, con you know about the Geneva Convention, yeah, I've developed a sort of con Geneva Convention with these people, because it's very easy if you're sitting in 2022 writing about somebody, you know, I'm in a nice comfortable desk with my computer in front of me, and I can make all sorts of judgments with the benefit of hindsight, and the people that I'm writing about had to make rotten decisions on the spot with limited information when they were frightened, cold, hungry, had stomach ache, um, all, the th oh yeah, all the things that you would suffer in battle, your boot laces cutting into your feet because you haven't taken your boots off for three days, um, you're wet, your trousers are probably wet, you know, you're not in your best to make these decisions and people, some people make bad decisions. I'm not going to sit in judgment after, on them after all this time. So I'm careful about that. If I know that somebody died horribly, I'm torn in half. Because on the one hand, my job is not to wrap up the reality of war. On the other, there may be a family out there. Um, uh, so that's a difficult balance. And I've, had, I've judged both ways at different times. I tend to err on the side of putting it in. Because I think one of the things that frightens me most at the moment is that there are too many people around who have not lived through wars and therefore don't realise quite how horrible it is and why you've got to take great care about it all. Um, uh, so it, it's a difficult, I mean it sounds like a huge moral question and uh, you know, I, it, it is something I take seriously and I try to get it right but I do try to give these 
people a good press um, and give them the benefit of the doubt. There's one person in the book that I've just completed, and this is at the printers now, who was a general, who was an absolute stinker as far as I can make out. Nobody liked him at all. He was completely and utterly, as far as I can make out, with any hum without any human warmth at all. Um, even with him, I've tamed it down a bit. But I haven't found anybody who said anything good about him. What, of course, you go back to, you fall back on, is what people at the time said. And a lot of this, although I've put it together, assembled it, and I've linked it and explained it, but a lot of this is their own words. And those are the most interesting bits in them. And it's not for me to tinker with those. Does that sort of answer your question? I hope so. Yeah, because I was, uh, yeah, my question was basically just how do you decide which bits of history uh, sort of best to be left out of your books, and I think yeah. you've answered that pretty well, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> well, I thought, it was a I thought it was a jolly good question, so thank you. Um, could you tell us about the book that you just finished? Yes. So yes. It's quite a personal one in a way, because it's um, something I grew up with, because my, my father was in, uh, uh, in a brigade that did exactly this, um, this particular route. It's called So Red a Road which is a quotation from Thomas Hardy. Um, and it says that, um, I'll, I'll paraphrase it, but essentially it says that uh, I've seen a lot of war and uh, I am not convinced that m many goals are worth the reaching by so red a road. So war's not worth it, mostly. So it tells the story of three battalions in a brigade, the 4th Dorsets, the 5th Dorsets, and the 7th Hampshires, who fought their way from Normandy through to the end of the war at Bremen in Germany. And they lost um, a lot of people, a lot of young men um, in Normandy. Their casualties were like the First World War, almost. Um, and um, so that's, that's the one that I've been, been writing. Uh, very sad, um, some interesting stories, lots and lots of quotes from people, including some of the old boys that we knew here, uh, one of whom, Ron Beale, only died two years ago, um, just, just as Covid was starting, age 98, um, and he survived, so he'd been a Dorset policeman. So, so there's some happy stories as well, people who survived and came through it all. My question is, now that you're a rather experienced writer, if you could go back to yourself before you wrote your first book, what advice would you give yourself and also what have you learned since then? Take more risks, so don't play safe. Um, back your, put some opinions in, but obviously back them up with evidence. An opinion is of no value whatever unless there is some evidence behind it, as I'm sure your history and English teachers will have told you repeatedly. But it's true, isn't it? You know, if, um, if a politician says something, do you believe them? But if they point to some evidence that supports it, you start to think, well, maybe. The other thing, of course, that a really good writer always does is they don't tell you. They show you. So you illustrate through character. And one of the things that I think I've learned through these is that they need, a history needs just as much plot, character, and momentum as any novel does to keep it going. And it's more difficult because you can't make it up. You've got to find it from amongst the material and try and put that in. So I think, um, yeah, I think those are the things. And also, of course, that not to worry too much about writer's block because there isn't such a thing. You can work your way around it by just concentrating on the stuff that's flowing rather than worry, chipping away at some hard surface that's not, uh, not yielding anything. That wasn't a bad image, actually, was it? Did you like that? <laughs> I wanted to do the general was that nobody liked. I, oh, yeah, his name was General Sir Ivor Thomas, and he was known as Butch, which was short for butcher. Um, and he was, and if you think of the caricature of the First World War general, which wasn't actually fair, but if you think of the caricature of that, he was pretty much like that. He was humorless. 
he was seemed to be unaffected by high casualties, um, uh, uh, and he was pretty arrogant, and he drove rather than led. But he was also a brave man, and he could be quite surprising. So, for example, he talked to people in England. He knew that he was going to have to move his men very quickly, so he taught people in Eng his um, units in England to jump on any pe any vehicle they possibly could, a tank, an armored personnel car, anything that happens to be going in that direction, you get on it and you move. And they, so it was called quick lift. And that was his idea, and it was a very good one. It meant that actually they, could, they had mobility that other people lacked because they thought in those terms. He also, in a period uh, just before they crossed the Rhine, uh, when um, they hadn't got a lot to do, they were just in a, the Reichswald Forest on the borders of Germany and the Netherlands, um, and it was largely a time of patrolling and holding the line after Arnhem. He taught, uh, he, decided, he re recreated the divisional battle school that they'd had in England. And they were running courses for the for the you know just in those few three weeks or so, and they were running courses for for soldiers out of the line. So he was not wholly bad. He was a thoroughgoing professional, but you wouldn't have you wouldn't have invited him round for Christmas. <laughs> what was the strangest or most unexpected thing that you found out about researching field books? Oh, yes, <laughs> yeah, I can tell you this, it's, and it's very recent. When I was writing So Red a Road, no, I'll start with another story, no, because these are connected. <laughs> okay, um, when I was a little boy, on the landing we had a thing called an ottoman. I've never come across an ottoman anywhere else, but it was like a, a, a little thing you could sit on, but it opened and inside you could keep things. Yeah? Inside the ottoman was a parachute, cam camouflage smock. And in the camouflage smock, there were two holes, one here and one there, yeah. And beside the camouflage smock was a webbing shoulder strap. And in the webbing shoulder strap, there were two holes. And what it amounted to was my dad had been wearing, he, he wore this camouflage smock for clearing out the garage and dirty jobs like that. Um, and it stank, it was disgusting, really unpleasant. But he, um, he'd worn that and a German parachutist had fired a whole magazine of a Schmeiser uh, machine gun. You'll know what a Schmeiser is. <laughs> and um, missed him completely. One went through his beret. One went actually through the um, webbing, webbing shoulder strap, through the camouflage smock, out through the camouflage smock the other side, and out through the webbing shoulder strap the other side, and missed him. And he was wearing all of them. Um, one hit the road and a tiny piece hit him there, so he had a tiny little scar uh, on his hand, but it, all it did was cut in. But when he turned round, he realised that one of his corporals had followed him across the railway crossing, and he had been less lucky, and he'd been shot dead. Now that corporal was called Wilfred Porteous, and in 1981, my wife and I went to uh, where that was, which was near Clave in Germany, where Anne of Cleves came from, um, and we found the railway crossing where Corporal Porteous was killed, and we went to the cemetery and we found his grave, and I took a photograph of the grave and I brought it home and showed my father. So I grew up with the story of Corporal Porteous. So when I was writing the book that I've just finished now, just as I was writing what I called a personal postscript, which is why it mattered to me, I thought I'll start with Wilfred Porteous. So I talked about Wilfred Porteous and I told, told them about the camouflage smock. And while I was writing it, I thought I'd like to know more about Wilfred Porteous, because actually, you know, I've been to his grave, but what about him? So I got onto Ancestry. And there he was, and I knew that he came from the northeast, he came from near Durham, and I discovered that from the 1939 register that he'd been a hairdresser in Hampshire, uh, in Southampton, uh, before the war, and then he'd enlisted, and I found that he had two sons, 
And then I found that his son was on the web. He'd worked on the war memorial in the northeast, and I was able to talk to him. And Wilfred's son, John, now aged 80, sent me all the photographs he'd got of his father, the originals, so that I could see what his dad looked like. And he just put them in the post to me. And I thought, that's unbelievably trusting, because you know, you know who I was. Um, so I had these, this photograph of him. Um, and one of the things, I, and he'd also gone to the Ministry of Defence and he'd got his father's service records. Now, I knew Wilfred Porteous as a Somerset Light Infantryman. What I didn't realise was that he, because he'd been a, uh, a hairdresser in Southampton, when war broke out, he enlisted not in the Somerset Light Infantry or in the Durhams, who would have been his local regiment from where he was born, he enlisted in the Hampshire Regiment. And do you know he landed with this lot, who I'd written about on D-Day? He'd been there before he went to my father. And he'd fought all the way through um, uh, that campaign, through the Normandy battles at Arnhem, and then when this lot were all sent back to England, he was kept on and he was sent to join the 4th Somerset Light Infantry where he met my father. And then he was killed beside him on the railway crossing. And that, I just thought, wow, what a coincidence, because I've written about him, you know, in this. And I didn't even know he was there. But very touching. And I think, if you want to know one of the things that gives me the biggest kick out of all of this, it is the relationships that you build up with other people whose dads were there, or whose uncles were there. Now I mentioned Ron Beale earlier on. Ron Beale was a Dorset policeman. Before he was a Dorset policeman, he was a Dorset soldier, and he was wounded in Normandy. He was a very gentle soul, and he had a lovely, lovely smile. 200 watt smile, really lovely. His best friend was killed beside him in Normandy, and his best friend was called Eddie Snook, and he came from Shillingston, and you'll find him on the Shillingston War Memorial. And he was Ron's best man when Ron married in 1942. And not very long ago, um, some people turned up here and they said, we'd like to know about my uncle who was in the um, Fourth Dorsets and was killed in Normandy. His name was Snook. And I said, that's Eddie Snook. And I was able to show them the film we'd made about Ron talking about Eddie. I was able to put them in touch with the family. And we held a tea party around this table with all the snooks sitting one side and all the beals sitting the other. And they were enormous friends. It was like a family reunion. They'd never met before. What they'd got in common was that their fathers had served together and were good friends. And that side of it's just lovely. And, you know, Wilfred Porteous's son sending me that, those photographs and trusting me with them. And the response I had from all the people who knew Jack. It's a very special relationship and it's, it's one that continues through the families. And that's partly what this place is about. That's a very long answer to your question, <laughs> isn't it? Was it interesting? I hope so. I was all right. Good. Excellent. You're last, aren't you? Yes. You've been very patient. <laughs> I was wondering, like, I know I know that war is full of all sorts of horrible things, but I also know that there were some rather like funny encounters that people had. Like, yeah. and so I know, I know that war was full of awful things. Absolutely. But it was also uh, full of people, and people often do silly or funny things, so I was wondering if you know about any sort of uh, funny encounters that anybody had that you've researched? One of the things that I really liked about the Bomber Command people that I got to know was their irreverent sense of humour. They had a wonderful sense of humour, and it was the same one, and it didn't matter whether they were rear gunners or pilots, whether they were ex-public school boys or whether they were um, from uh, you know, elementary schools, um, uh, they all shared it. And um, I think if you, if you wanted to capture it, there's a, um, he's no longer with us unfortunately, but he, he, he wrote a series of books 
about his experiences as a bomber pilot. And one of them is called Lancaster Target, and his name was Jack Curry. And he was hysterically funny. I mean, he was a really cocky little so-and-so. There's no question about it. He was 19 years old, and he knew best about everything. And it didn't really change. I mean, I knew him when he was in his 70s. And uh, he was still like that. Um, but he was one of the most professional pilots you can imagine. And he would land a Lancaster. He would always... Do you remember the chap who landed the a aircraft on the Hudson? Or yeah, Sully. Yeah, he was like that. Um, he was every flight for Sully seems to have been an exercise in perfection. He wanted to get it absolutely right, and Jack Curry was like that. He really was. He wanted to get it right, and he would land a Lancaster back from a raid, and he would try to do a three-point landing in a Lancaster. Now you you know. They weren't designed to do that. You do that in little, sort of gent little biplanes and things that are easy to ma and manoeuvrable. Those things you land, you know, on the first two wheels, and then you screech to a halt, and the tail comes down, bonk, and that's the end of the landing. Yes, not Jack. He would keep it right in the air till the very last moment, and then um, stall when the wheels were about two feet off the ground. So what I learned about those bomb not command people was that there was this very there was this fantastic lightness of touch this wonderful irreverence they took the mickey out of each other constantly and it went on I, mean, I went to reunions with them years later and they were still doing it when they were in their 70s and 80s um, but at the back of it was this real professionalism and the final point I'd make actually apart from the humour, which I, no, I think that is a really important point. It's something that doesn't come over in a lot of films about war. That light, I watched the, did you see Dunkirk, the Christopher whatever it is version? It just didn't ring true. And one of the reasons it didn't ring true was because it was all the same, it was monotonous, it was one tone, all the way through, it was depressing. And actually, it war wasn't like that. You talk to them, there were moments, there were high moments of enormous fun. Um, and there was this colossal comradeship that you'd never find again anywhere. And because of the nature of the Second World War and the evil that they were fighting, uh, I think there was a, a clear sense of purpose about it. Um, but you're absolutely right, the humour is a really important part of it. And people who leave that out, um, as a, so a really nice bit, Jack Curry, I must tell you about it. His <laughs> wife was in the WAFs, so that was the Women's Air, Auxiliary Air Force, and they were known as WAFs. And where they lived was always um, colloquially known as the Waffery. <laughs> and uh, Jack phoned up to speak to her, and um, he, got through, he got through to this rather pompous WAF, and said, he said, is that the Waffery? And, they, and she said, this is the um, Women's Auxiliary Air Force officer's mess, yes? To whom do you wish to speak? Anyway, his, um, his wife, then came, and Nina, came to, the, came to the telephone. And he said, is that the whom to which I wish to speak to? <laughs> <laughs> it was a lovely, a lovely deflating sense of humour, uh, which I liked very much. I miss him terribly. I remember watching a WAF who'd been engaged to a chap who was killed and she had describing when she was told that he was killed and she came back to um, the station having been for a walk and there was a party going on and you know you can't you can't stop for that sort of thing because people need to let off steam they need to have fun while they could it, there are good reasons for, for doing that but very hard, of course, for somebody who's just lost someone. It's why Milligan books are worth reading, if any. Brilliant. Yeah. They, uh, he, he writes about the funny side of his Second World War experiences, but also the tragic sides, doesn't it? It's done really well, um, and they're well worth reading. You mentioned Dunkirk, and obviously you didn't like it very much. Um, what's your favourite historical film? About war? Or about historical film? Historical, yeah, about war. Best war film is The Cruel Sea. Absolutely <laughs> no question. Okay.
Yeah, do you agree? It's so good. It's, um, uh, and that was Barry, you know Barry Norman, the film critic? That was his dad made that. Um, and it, it absolutely rings true. And it, what's it about? It's about relationships again, isn't it? It's about how these people get, and that's got a love, that's got a wonderful line in it. Because when, when they join, when, when, this, is the, 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 this is the funniest war joke I know, brilliant. Uh, when they join the, um, uh, their ship, they have a really nice captain, who's an ex-merchant navy captain, and they have these young sub-lieutenants who have only just joined and really don't know anything about it. And they have a first lieutenant who's a bully and a loudmouth, and everybody hates him. And they realise, after they've done a couple of convoys across the Atlantic, escorting merchant ships across and it's really unpleasant and dangerous and new boats and uh, rotten seas and all, you know, people being seasick all over the place in these little corvettes that they were in. They realise just how awful it's going to be and this chap doesn't like it at all and they drop into conversation that the Navy take duodenal ulcers very seriously because if you have a duodenal ulcer it may blow up when you're at sea and if it blows up when you're at sea you're um, uh, you, you know, you, you may die, and you'll be out of action. So, they, if you have a suspected duodenal ulcer, you'll, you won't go to sea. Anyway, they're sitting around having their dinner in this film. Brilliant. And um, uh, this chap suddenly, in the middle of eating these sausages, clutches his stomach and yells, and then rushes from the room. And the other officers, of course, have already planted this idea. Um, with him that, that, about the Judean Arsenal, so they know exactly what's going on. So um, the, uh, one of them's laughing, and the captain, who doesn't know anything about this, says, looks at, looks at him and wonders why he's laughing. And um, uh, so he said, "Well, I, I was thinking about something else, sir." So one of the other young officers who does know what's going on says, it hardly does you credit, number one, as, as, uh, 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 it hardly does you credit, Lockhart, when um, the first lieutenant is in pain. I wouldn't have thought you'd be able to laugh at anything else. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, that's a very, very good film, I think. The Dam Busters, I think, is incredible. There is a, book, a film called The Appointment in London, which was actually made by somebody who was on Guy Gibson's squadron. He even wrote the music for it. He was a composer. Um, and that, I think, is extremely good. So those are the, the war films that I think work. I watched last night, which was a grave error, um, A Bridge Too Far, and I'd forgotten just how bad it was. It really is a very, very bad film indeed. Um, uh, and I switched it off. I'd recorded it so I could have a look at it again <laughs> after all these years, and it was absolutely dreadful. Um, what do you think of War Horse, Christopher? I haven't seen it. Have you not? Actually, no. about the Dorset, so I wondered if it was odd watching a film about something that you've written about. Tony I am very, very wary about watching anything about animals. Right. Because I am incredibly sentimental about animals thank you for listening to this week's podcast i hope you enjoyed it the young historians is a group of um, 14 to 18 year olds who really enjoy history and meet up at the keep museum every week in order to work on specific projects to further our um, education If you'd like to get involved with Young Historians, please contact Flora Scott on admin at keepmilitarymuseum.org or visit our website for more information.